Good evening, it's six o'clock. I'm Miranda Shunker in the GB newsroom. The Prime Minister will travel to Eastern Europe next week as part of efforts to prevent a possible Russian invasion of Ukraine. Downing Street say Boris Johnson is determined to accelerate diplomatic efforts and will also speak to President Putin on the phone. He'll consider a range of options to discourage Russian aggression, including fresh military deployments and bolstering NATO defences. Speaking to GB News, former Defence Secretary Ian Duncan Smith urged the European Union now to stand up to Russia. If they invade Ukraine, I think it is a threat to the way we live our lives. It is a threat to NATO. This is a democracy. It's a country that has the right to free choice. We've been giving them arms. I wish the rest of the European Union now would actually back up what the UK and America are doing. A 60-year-old woman has been killed by a falling tree in Aberdeen as Storm Malik brought winds of up to 100 miles per hour. Northern Power Grid say 30,000 customers are without power currently and mobile phone coverage has been affected in northern parts of the UK. Scotland's First Minister Nicola Sturgeon has warned some homes could be without power for the rest of the weekend as the newly announced Storm Corrie arrives tomorrow. Yellow, yellow weather warnings for wind remain in place across much of the UK. A former attorney general has criticised the Met Police over its handling of the Downing Street party allegations. Lord Morris says he's dismayed with Scotland Yard after Sue Gray was asked by the force to make sure her report made minimal reference to number 10 events they're looking into. It's led to claims that police were delaying its publication, something they deny. Former advisor to Theresa May, Joey Jones, thinks the police should reflect now on their own conduct. Probably the Met that have more questions to ask themselves at the moment as to how they've allowed themselves to get into a situation where there are there's so much cynicism, so much anger that could have been avoided quite easily just by being a bit more transparent and, and a bit more upfront about the reasons behind their decision making. A major overhaul of the highway code has come into force today and there are concerns that millions of drivers are simply unaware of the changes. New guidance means traffic will have to give way when pedestrians cross at a junction. Cyclists should also prioritise riding in the centre of lanes on quieter roads to make themselves more visible. The changes aim to boost protection for cyclists and pedestrians. Edmund King, president of the AA, spoke to GB News earlier. 141 cyclists were killed on the roads last year, more than 4,000 injured. Some five people every day actually die on the road. So it, it's trying to say, look, the roads are there. They're there to be shared. And the Canadian singer Joni Mitchell has asked streaming site Spotify to remove her music over COVID misinformation concerns. The Grammy Award winner says the site allows irresponsible people to spread lies that were costing people their lives. Earlier this week, Neil Young removed his catalogue from Spotify, reportedly due to its hosting of the Joe Rogan Experience podcast, which has been known to air the views of vaccine sceptics. Well, on TV, online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB. GB News will have more at the top of the next hour. So looking ahead then to this evening's weather and the UK looking generally drier and brighter with winds easing as Storm Malik thankfully passes. Let's look at the detail. Rain and cloud clearing throughout the southwest and southeast of England to leave a dry and fine evening. Temperatures dropping tonight though, leading to a frost for many. A fine evening across the southeast of England. Skies clearing this evening to make way for a chilly night and allowing frost again to form in some places. Moving across to Wales now, and there will be the odd light shower there this evening. Those skies will clear, allowing temperatures to drop as well. And zooming in to the Midlands. Well, there will be some light showers around to the end of the day, but dry for most people there. Let's take you then across to the Pennines now and that rather blustery day that it's been so far easing off into this evening and the skies also across the Pennines clearing eventually, making way for a cold night again and a frost forming for many. Scattered showers affecting Scotland this evening, some turning wintry over high ground. A calmer night though, lighter winds. And then moving over to Northern Ireland. 
Some isolated showers across the area today. Tonight, winds easing and some clear spells allowing temperatures to drop and frost once again. And that's how the weather's shaping up overnight and into tomorrow morning. Hello, this is the Saturday Selection on GB News with me, Esther McVeigh. And me, Philip Davis. Coming up, we find out what it's like to be a Tory leader who doesn't have the confidence of his party. The celebrity hairdresser, Nicky Clark, tells us what he'd do if he ruled the world. And we're joined in the studio by an inspirational young woman who has entered the Guinness Book of Records. But first, let's look at some of the stories that's caught our eye this week. Phil. And I'd say it's been quite a week in Parliament. We've been waiting for the Sue Gray report. We now have, you know, the outrage over police investigations going to there. Have the 54 letters gone into Graham Brady uh, for the vote of no confidence? And none of that has happened yet. No, it's just like every other week in Parliament, <laughs> isn't it? You know, everything about Partygate, uh, no no confidence vote in the Prime Minister, no report from Sue Gray. Ev Every 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 week's the same in in Parliament at the moment, isn't it? I'm hoping for a bit of different next week. A bit, a bit, a bit more excitement if we can cope with it. But what go on? What's been, in, you know, what's well the thing that the thing the main thing that caught my eye this week. Um, it's it's usually bad news. Everything I read is usually bad news. There was a bit for me of good news this week, and that was uh, James Forsyth, the uh, political editor of the Spectator, wrote a column in the in the Times and. I don't think there's anybody more clued in to what's going on than James Forsyth. So and, I reckon... and, who, and who is uh, his wife? Allegra Stratton, isn't Exactly. It? Exactly. So she knows exactly what exactly. has been going Absolutely. on. Absolutely. So whether or not she's still as tuned in to what's in. going on... Clued in, I'm no, sure she know, is. But, Her phone uh, will be ringing all the time. Uh, but anyway, um, but James definitely is. And he wrote in The Times that the Prime Minister was prepared to drop proposals for the ban on buy one, get one free offers on, on things that the Department of Health consider unhealthy. Uh, the government were planning uh, in the health and social care bill to tell supermarkets what shelves they could put what products on. I mean, how we got to that stage, Lord only knows. But apparently, according to James Forsyth, the Prime Minister is thinking or is prepared to ditch all this, throw it all overboard uh, and stop this kind of nanny statism, which I thought was a massive... A massive triumph. And I can reveal it because you've also been fighting for this for three years. You know, why would you stop? Uh, buy one, get one free. And now, as we hit a cost of living crisis, why would you not let somebody buy one, get one free? If you want an extra pizza and throw it in your freezer, what is the problem of that? And actually, they have moved, they have wobbled uh, on that situation. Well, we're hoping that uh, we're hoping we're that hoping. wobbling. Now, well, I know you know all the technicalities of what oh. they're hoping to do because they haven't done it so far. They never budge for years and years. Years. They're now going to try and do it in the Lords, but it's leaving it a bit late and it's making it a little bit complicated by trying to do an amendment in the Lords, isn't it? Yeah, the bill's gone through the Commons, yeah. despite my best efforts to try and stop this particular thing. It's, it went through the Commons, and um, but it's, it's now in the Lords. So the government could table an amendment in the Lords to delete all of this stuff out of the bill. But, of course, the Lords might not accept that amendment. Yeah. So uh, who knows what would... What would happen then? But this is certainly a step in the right direction. And, of course, look, no, no product itself is unhealthy. It's a diet that's unhealthy. But itself. this was part of a story as well, saying that he's now being held hostage by his own MPs who are sort of saying, if you don't want our letter to go in, then you've got to do these things. Get on track and be a Conservative. I think Lord Frost gave it him with both barrels, didn't he? He said, get rid of all your socialists in number 10, get rid of your green fanatics in number 10, get rid of the woke brigade in number 10. That's exactly right. <laughs> Have a good clear out and get back to uh, what you should be doing. The big story, I think, that caught my eye was about the care homes told that sort of it's unlimited access now mm -hmm. for family members to be able to go in. It's humane to be able to see your family members. Now, there's a couple of things uh, that sort of... Um, made my heart sink with that. One, of course, you should have been seeing your family members. You should have been seeing your family members for the last two years. How inhumane that people couldn't see their elderly uh, relatives. But if you now say there's unlimited uh, visitors who can go in, some of these might have been vaccinated, some of them might not, because they might be young, old, health condition, whatever it is. We have lost all those care workers going back to the 11th of November because they weren't double jabbed. And now we're saying we don't 
We don't care anybody could go in, and yet you've lost all these workers. So I personally uh, never believe there should have been that mandatory uh, vaccination, and uh, and that's something we've got to look now at with the NHS workers. Well, anyway, that's our sort of roundup of what's been uh, happening this week. What we thought were some of the big stories. What do you think has been uh, the big stories? Do you agree with us on that? So send in your emails to us. Uh, that's gbviews at gbnews.uk. Now. Now, the Boris Johnson Premiership limps on, with the Metropolitan Police helping to halt the full publication of the Sue Gray report for the foreseeable future. And that seems to have done enough, for now <laughs> at least, to persuade a lot of the Tory MPs who were preparing to submit letters of no confidence in the Prime Minister to hold off. But what happens when the moment finally arrives and you realise your party no longer wants you? Well, sir, Ian Duncan Smith was Conservative leader from 2001 to 2003, but resigned after losing a vote of no confidence. Ian is on the line now. Thanks for joining us. So talk us through those days and weeks when you found out your colleagues were plotting against you. Ah, oh, hi, sir. Hi, Phil. Um... I don't think he ever stopped plotting against me or anybody else for that matter. It was like a perpetual, it was like a perpetual uh, revolution going on. And the truth is, uh, for me, it was different. I was in the opposition. So leaders of the opposition, they get a tough time because you're out of power and uh, parties tend to turn in on themselves when you're out of power. We'd come out of the uh, disastrous attack on Margaret Thatcher. John Major had gone through and fallen to the worst election defeat all time. William had bumped along for uh, two or three years, uh, and then I'd taken over. And the truth is, at that stage, the party was, you know, as I used to say, um, the party could have a fight in an empty room. Uh, the problem <laughs> with that was the empty room almost always won. Uh, and it's a point, really, until parties decide they want power, then they just do this uh, to each other. And eventually, they wake up one morning and go, do you know what, it'd be not a bad idea if we actually got into government to do a few things. And then things start to change. So, yeah, I mean, you know, you go, you face it. As far as I was concerned, uh, it was it had been a tough grind. There was a false story put out about me, for which I was subsequently completely cleared, and my wife too. So all of that was part of the process. But um, I never looked back with regrets because I set up the Centre for Social Justice afterwards and carried on doing the things I wanted to do. But yeah, it can be uh, it can be a bit oppressive at times. I think, Ian, uh, one of the things that people fail to recognise is that you actually got more votes in that no-confidence vote than you had actually in the, in the leadership election. You'd actually been gaining votes during that time. I think that sometimes gets, gets overlooked. I just wondered, uh, given your experience, uh, how do you think the Prime Minister will be feeling at the moment with this sort of hanging over him? Well, any leader that finds their parties uh, doing this is, will feel beleaguered. There's no question about it. You can't. You have to try and put a brave face on it and go on, but you need to. You want to get through the particular crisis which is causing this. In this particular case, uh, the whole issue around what happened uh, during the lockdown. Um, I was listening to you, Esther, earlier on about uh, things that we shouldn't have done during lockdown, and one of the things. Well, first of all, I was concerned about the nature of the lockdown, certainly after the first one. But it was this ridiculous restrictions around funerals and visiting your loved ones and dying relatives. This was ridiculous, frankly. And it's because of that that we are now in this situation. Because, of course, you know, it was very hard on people, unnecessarily hard, uh, you know, to stop people attending funerals and things. And that's why this problem has arisen. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a subject of what happens when you crack down and impose things on people to such a degree uh, that it damages their natural form of decision-making and their lives. And I think that's where the problem exists. And so what changes do you think the Prime Minister needs to make if he's going to be able to carry on in, in his job? Are you, are you with Lord Frost that he needs to kick out all of the socialists and <laughs> green fanatics and all the rest of it out of number 10? Well, I would put it like this. The Prime Minister uh, needs to uh, pause and think about what we were elected to do with that overall majority. We were elected not just to get Brexit done, but to deliver the benefits of Brexit, which is really critical. So, for example, we should have had, we need to get free ports out there, double quick time with full tax relief. Nothing better to level up than to stick free ports in an area attracting new business investment. We should have done this by now. We should have put one in Scotland. We should be offering one to Northern Ireland. I produced a report back in April uh, for the government on regulatory change and reform. If we get this right now, we're outside the EU, we could raise hundreds of billions of pounds into infrastructure investment from the private sector, not 
constantly from the taxpayer, huge potential resources, new markets, metal tech, uh, uh, trials, uh, nutraceuticals in the medical side, which are even bigger than the city. Real opportunity for us to make the UK really competitive. And of course, we've got to sort the protocol out and get the, um, uh, these boats sorted out that are coming across the channel. These are the things that we said we would do. So I think the prime minister has to recognize that this is his focus. I believe that is where he is in a way heading right now and to clear out all the other stuff that exists, go for the policies that people voted for us for, deliver on those. And I think we'll find that the electorate will go, great, well, they did what they said, uh, let's give them another term. Now, when you say it like that, follow your manifesto, mm -hmm. what you were voted in on, it sounds, ooh, all so easy. Radical. But people get sort of swept away. Hence, uh, uh, Lord Frost is wanting to sweep out those advisers who are pulling them in the wrong direction. But I know I've caught you in a coffee shop in your constituency uh, this morning. You've been out and about speaking to people on the ground. And what are they saying? Are they as angry as all the front pages are about mm -hmm. the party gate, about the police investigation now? Or are they like you, looking for things to be solved, sorted out, as you say, the people coming across the water from France to Dover, making sure, you know, the energy doesn't go too expensive. What are they wanting? Well, it's really the latter. I have to tell you, uh, I think many, many people out there are just heartily sick and tired of this incredible focus that's going on around this one issue. Uh, many of them face serious issues in their lives. They want to get them sorted out. They're worried about things like migration, they wonder, you know, what are the benefits of Brexit? Let's see them. All these things are important to them. Daily lives don't re re resolve around what happens necessarily in the interworkings of Downing Street. They just want to know that the government knows what is necessary, what they voted for, and deliver it. And I think that's the key thing. Sometimes what happens when governments come in with big, big majorities, uh, they, they think sometimes, well, we can do anything we want. And the answer is, <clears throat> no, you can't. You need to focus on the things that you were elected to do and get those done. And I think this is a moment where we just have to remind ourselves that we've had this. I mean, to be fair to the government, fair to the prime minister, COVID has been a terrible blow to government. It's put us back on some of the things we should have done. But that gives us more reason now to use this as an opportunity to say, right, let's accelerate, prioritize all these things that really affect daily lives of people, improve their incomes, give them better business choices, give them opportunity, better housing. All those things are really important to people. And that's what they're talking about. I've had a number of them say, I'm sick and tired of all of this. Don't you people do anything else uh, but bang on about the same issue. Get, get on and govern. Ian, while we've got you, you've been uh, incredibly robust about Russia and, and China. And I, I just wondered if you could share with us what you think the government should do if it does get to the point where Russia do invade Ukraine. Well, number one, as you know, I've been sanctioned by the Chinese government. So uh, all my family and I, uh, if we had any investments, would have them curtailed. And almost certainly if we go to a country which has expedition, uh, then they would possibly put a red notice on us and get us arrested and ready for expedition. So all of that is a fact for what? For calling out the fact the Chinese government has been committing genocide without question and using slave labor in China to a huge industrial scale, redolent of what happened in during the Second World War under the Nazis uh, and the Germans in, um, uh, in, the, in the West. And so we have to take what I consider now to be this new axis of totalitarian states, China, Russia, Belarus, possibly also Iran and others. Uh, we have to take that seriously because our values, the way that we govern, the way that we live our lives, the freedoms that we take for granted in the UK and abroad are really under threat. And the problem is, Countries like Germany and others have become so dependent, in their case, on Russia for gas that they would literally bypass all their allies in the East uh, just to be able to get greedily that gas. And with us, it's our dependency on Chinese goods that stop us really going after the Chinese on these issues. So we need governments in the West to get together now and decide that they can't go on allowing themselves to be as dependent on these totalitarian regimes. It's time we brought some of this manufacture back to the UK, invest in countries, maybe like India, much more, where they have a democracy, <clears throat> at least they have the rule of law. Our problem is we've, we've literally failed to look at this properly. We've got to make big changes. If they invade Ukraine, I think it is a threat to the way we live our lives. It is a threat to NATO. This is a democracy. It's a country that has the right to free choice. And there are no such things as these ghastly Soviet spheres of influence that Putin, who's turning out to be one of the most 
ghastly uh, dictators that you can possibly imagine should have his way on. So we must stand up to him on that. And we've been giving them arms. I wish the rest of the European Union now would actually back up what the UK and America are doing. And one final point, Bill. It always takes the Democrats in America a long time to figure out who their real ally is. Uh, and eventually it's a crisis that does it. And they realize now they can't rely on the EU for this. They have to come back to the UK. It's the UK and the US that are leading, so they should. When we're together, the world is a better place. Ian Duncan-Smith, thank you very much indeed for joining us this morning. Pleasure. Coming up, we find out more about a bill to boost British Sign Language. Stay with us. Hello there, I'm Eamon. And I'm Isabel. And you're watching the GB News digital stream across the United Kingdom. And around the world. If you're here in the UK, you can also watch us on your TV screen. GB News is Freeview Channel 236. On Sky, we're Channel 515. 626 on Virgin Media. Just remember, you might need to retune your TV to watch the channel. Yeah, and if you are doing that, find out more about retuning by going to gbnews.uk. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints well, over a drink. We have a civilized conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. I'm Dan Wilson. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wilson tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News. Hello, this is the Saturday Selection and Gary Webster emailed in. Uh, you do that by uh, going to gbviews at gbnews.uk and he said this, everyone is asking the wrong questions. It's not about whether Boris or anyone else for that matter broke lockdown rules. It's why the people in the UK were subjected to such draconian restrictions that should be the focus of our anger. To prevent people from seeing dying relatives was inhumane. In time, we will look back on this pe period as an abject failure on the part of the government to uphold our personal freedoms. And that is what I was saying when I was talking about what news item had caught my eye, and that was all of the uh, care homes opening up and all relatives could go there. And obviously Ian Duncan-Smith was saying exactly the same thing. We did all these lockdowns and uh, the fallout of that I I is, still, is still happening. Right. Well, every week on Saturday Selection, we like to speak to an MP who is trying to get a private member's bill through Parliament. Uh, yesterday, Labour's uh, West Lancashire MP Rosie Cooper stood up in the House of Commons and spoke passionately about something that she really believes in, and that is the British Sign Language. So she stood up in the House. She's taking it forward as a private member's bill. Um, and that's what MPs can do. They can go into sort of whether it's a, a lottery at the start of the year to try and get their private member's bill uh, selected. Or uh, you can uh, try and bring uh, it through uh, the House when, um, when you get a possible chance to do that. But uh, we've got now... Rosie Cooper. Uh, her campaign has been backed by the actress and Strictly Come Dancing winner, Rose Ailing Ellis, who people will remember inspired so many of us with her performances on the dance floor, despite being profoundly deaf. 
We're pleased to say Rosie, uh, Rosie Cooper joins us now. Rosie, why is this campaign so important to you? It's very important that we unlock the potential of every deaf person in the country. Um, and all of that is lost if people can't communicate. Once you can communicate, you can have access to education, work, um, all the good, good things of life all come from being able to communicate with your fellow man. And deaf people, deafness is an invisible um, uh, thing, so you can't see somebody's deaf. So it's so easy to ignore them, not have good participation. And, you know, I saw the way it really affected my parents' lives. Really good, hardworking, intelligent people who struggled every day to actually have their place in the world. They did. And, you know, more power to their elbow. But it is a tough thing. You grew up in a household uh, with uh, profoundly deaf parents. So for you, this has been a long journey to try and get the British Sign Language recognised. It is. I, I've been an MP for 16 years and never at any time um, have I drawn a private member's bill and I'm coming to the end of my career and, you know, I've, I've drawn first out the, the bag, but with the Commons... Um, uh, rules and regulations, the person who's actually drawn first goes last on the list. So that, of course, meant that my bill was last. And it, well, everybody said it had no chance of passing. So I'm grateful for everyone who's helped. And it is a right and just cause. As I said at the end of my speech yesterday, this isn't about politics. This is about doing the right thing. And yesterday, right across the chamber, they spoke as one and Parliament was at its best. We made a difference to the lives of deaf people from here on in. So n never mind looking back to the centuries BSL has existed. Here, from now onwards, deaf people will be able to have their language recognised, their legal rights, and people will be required to accommodate them. Each government department will be required to protect and promote and explain to the Secretary of State every um, few years what they've done what their standards are so it can't do anything other than improve lives for all of us really rosie you spoke passionately on the floor what it's like uh, as a child growing up with deaf parents and the extra pressures that you had to bear i did um but you know it's no different to any other child of deaf parents I mean, I talked about, I booked my first holiday when I was four. Obviously, I don't remember that, but I did. When we go into shops and things, my mum and dad are perfectly able to read and write. Um, but who can be bothered in the shop or, you know, writing stuff down? They weren't really that interested. It was much easier just to ask a kid what, what the... So I became the interpreter. Um, so, as I say, booked my first holiday then. Um, so right throughout my life, it was a role I assumed it was expected of me and it, 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 I was happy and grateful to do it. I learned so much, but the truth is children grow up faster and have much more pressure on them. They, they have to be bigger than their years. And um, whilst it, 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 it's life shaping as well as uh, character building, but it's not really that fair, is it, to a kid? Rosie, many congratulations on getting your bill through the second reading. I mean, for people who don't know, it's a shark-infested waters trying to get your bill through a second reading of a private member's bill. So <laughs> you and, and, and everybody should be, you know, very proud of what you've, what you've achieved there. Can you tell people exactly what difference this will make to people uh, who are deaf when your bill actually gets onto the statute book? Well, you and I wouldn't go to um, a, a, an interview, an appointment, and not be able to, well, if you, let's say you go to the job centre, you wouldn't go there as a hearing person and expect when you get there not to be able to um, ask questions or understand what they're saying to you. So why should a deaf person, um, you, when, you, it, when you go to a doctor's, it's a pre-arranged appointment and you go, and unless they have bothered to book an interpreter, how do you explain your symptoms and how do you understand the um, diagnosis that's been given to you? I mean. You know, I, I, I was in the room explaining to my dad that his cancer diagnosis was terminal. Um, I did that. I, 
but you know it just you've just got to imagine how hard that is to hear as, as a daughter never mind explain it and make sure that the person you're talking to your dad actually understands what it means and everybody else is just looking at you and going yeah yeah that, 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 right this is what we do that is just so hot and that is a daily occurrence in life and rose ailing ellis talked about privacy when she goes to the doctor she would need to take a family member or, or, or somebody be moved by it um it, it was a very moving speech but before i became an mp i actually worked for asda and um, i was in charge of the facilities and services for disabled customers and we we launched a flagship disability store in swindon when i was when i was there and we, and we actually offered all of the staff free sign language training and and actually the vast majority of them took it up and one thing that i was told and i'm just wondering if you can confirm this because when i was when we were setting this up i was told that there was actually regional variations in sign language like sort of regional accents in sign language is, 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 is that is that right Oh, absolutely. Um, in truth, a sign can be different in Liverpool than it is in Birmingham. And I said in my, the, the end of my speech yesterday in, a, in response to an intervention, um, that it's quite funny. I, I, I would be talking away, and I, I've done sign language since I was born, um, but obviously learned from my parents and the deaf community. And I'd do something and my dad go, stop. It, that's different now. We say this. And so absolutely. Sign language, I mean, I took my dad to California, to Disneyland, and I got him to meet with some friends of um, my friends who were deaf. They couldn't understand each other. The, the regional variations were so huge. <laughs> I was going to ask that about the Scouse sort of variation. What would Alan Sugar have to say about that, whether he'd be able to understand it or not? <laughs> um, now, Rosie, I kind of thought, how emotional was it for you yesterday? This has been a lifetime sort of for you to get this through. As Philip said, you managed to get it through the sort of second reading. You've been fighting for this a long time. When you left the chamber, how, how did you feel? Some people said to me, I must have felt proud. And I almost didn't feel that. I felt satisfied, I felt pride, but I felt satisfied. It was a job done, a job that needed to be done, a wrong that was righted. And um, I must admit, somebody, a friend of the family who know, used, know both my parents are dead now, but who knew them well, texted me. And I had to laugh out loud when I read it because the text said, your mum and dad would have been very proud, but I can hear your dad saying, what took you so long? <laughs> <laughs> uh, absolutely, but was there a moment for a tear or anything like that? Pardon? Was there a moment for a sort of a little tear? Did you, did, were you emotional? Yeah. Um, while we were in the bill, then no, but I did an interview um, with, I think it was Channel 5, and I, the lady said um, the presenter was going to appear in a second, so we were just chatting, but it actually was the interview. Um, but in that, because I was off guard, because I didn't think it was an interview a proper, um, she asked me about what it felt like, and I welled up because I was off guard. I just filled up. And yet, my dad would have, as he said to me um, when I, I did really well with my O-levels, came home and told him, and his response was, what's next? <laughs> because in our house, it was assumed you would just Whatever you, you had to achieve, there's a next step and you have to move forward and keep on going. That's the kind of guy he was. So, um, yeah, I, when I was off guard, it did really come home to me. It was, and I'm feeling, feeling it now. He would be so, he would he, he'd be very pleased with himself. Well, but, I'm sure everyone, your parents certainly would be very proud of you, Rosie, and I'm sure all of your constituents are too, and we are too. You did a great job yesterday, and we look forward to seeing it enter the statute book but very very well done and thank you for sharing your story with us today and i love your dad's words what took you so long and rosie <laughs> what's next that's what i want to know i'll see you next week what's next rosie thank you so much indeed now coming on thank you we found out what celebrity hairdresser nikki clark would do if he ruled the world so stay with us
Hello there, I'm Eamon. And I'm Isabel. And you're watching the GB News digital stream across the United Kingdom. And around the world. If you're here in the UK, you can also watch us on your TV screen. GB News is Freeview Channel 236. On Sky, we're Channel 515. 626 on Virgin Media. Just remember, you might need to retune your TV to watch the channel. Yeah, and if you are doing that, find out more about retuning by going to gbnews.uk. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilized conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. I'm Dan Wilson. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wilson tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from 6 to half past 9 on GB News. Welcome back. You're watching the Saturday Selection. We've got some GB views have come through. Angela says, I always thought IDS was a sound chap. Like his politics, I would have him as leader. That ain't going to happen. My next choice will be Esther and Philip. <laughs> I can't see that that's going to be a popular view around the country, that, to be honest. Is that two for um, the price of one there, the bog off that she, you're trying to save? Angela says we would get two for the price of one. You should start marketing yourself. <laughs> uh, Angela, thank you very much indeed for that. I can't say, I can't say that'll be a popular view around the country, though. Uh, this from Kirsty in Glasgow, uh, Scotland. I'm not deaf or hearing impaired, but I do believe that the BSL should be taught from the first day in primary school along with English, as I cannot think of a single profession where it would not be an advantage to you, especially as there is a small proportion of the population who are hearing uh, impaired uh, or deaf. I mean, that was a powerful um, piece there from Rosie. A whole life's Certainly. aim to get British Sign Language on the People say that books. MPs can't make a difference, but... She certainly has made a difference, hasn't she, yeah. with that? And John from Liverpool says, with the restrictions removed from care homes, all visitor vaccine are not allowed to enter. So what was the point of sacking the staff without a jab? John, my point exactly, that's what I said at the start of the show. What all these was Liverpool the point? All these sticking together on this one. <laughs> Typical of all political persuasion, they agree to sack all non-jabbed medical staff, but still allow all sick with or without a jab to enter hospitals. Time for the rule to be scrapped and shame on those who thought of this. It was not a plan. It was a disaster in waiting. John, I think many of us will agree with 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 that. And you've been making that point for quite some time. Because, you know, the care workers lost their job the end of last week. I mean, this year, um, it's going to be NHS staff from the 1st of April will all lose their job if they haven't been double jabbed. And what we're saying is transmission, whether you're vaccinated or not, occurs and um, people who go into work every day are testing to see if they're COVID free anyway. So you don't need to get rid of those stuff. So John, thank you very much indeed. Now a question for you. How many of you can do a burpee? Yes, that's right, a burpee. Some of you are wondering what I'm saying here. An exercise where you drop down to the, uh, to, down onto the floor flat and jump back up again. Can you do one? Can you do ten? How about 10,000? Our next guest decided to celebrate her birthday this year by breaking <laughs> the world record for the number of burpees completed in 24 hours and raise a lot of money for charity while she was doing it. Lauren Sullivan is the woman in question and she joins us in the studio now. Lauren, I can think of a better way to spend my birthday, <laughs> yeah. if you don't mind me saying so. <laughs> so, uh, come on. Why? 
Uh, yeah, I could think of a better way now, to be perfectly <laughs> honest. Um, I just decided to do something a bit different. Uh, the gym I work in, we're always doing crazy things like that. And I like burpees. Uh, I, it's all we could do in the first lockdown. So basically, when I could only do burpees, I decided one day, I think it was actually a member sent me the link and said, why don't you try and do this? And it was the one hour record. I was like, let's just try 24. And uh, I regretted it because I told everyone about it and then realised I couldn't back down once I told everyone. <laughs> so, yeah. And the thing is, when you do this and it's 24 hours, I didn't realise yeah. the strain that you put on your wrists yeah, yeah, and yeah. your body. They were in, like, bowls of ice for days afterwards. Yeah. In fact, you haven't done a burpee since... I haven't. So do you want to... I mean, today here, it's going to be your first yeah, burpee. Yeah, you are privileged. <laughs> <laughs> since your uh, world-breaking sort of Guinness Book of Records mm -hmm. record, if that's right. Do you want to show, you want to, yeah, show us okay. exactly show whatever? Because, of course, when most people think of a burpee, they probably thought you were drinking a can of Coke. Probably, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I can show you one. <laughs> right, we've got one. OK. Have we got this? Oh, oh. Yes, there we go. You might have to do two. Two? I'll tell you for why we've now got there. So that... So, Lauren did 24 yeah. hours of that. Yes. You broke the world record in about 13 hours, didn't you? I did, yeah. So... And, and then you took it easy. I mean, yeah. I, <laughs> I, I they take that. it that yeah. easy. Yeah, there's another quite, 11 hours to go. Yeah, I went quite quickly in the first four hours to try and get as many as I could. And then that's when my wrist started to hurt. So I was like, oh, this is going to get quite difficult. Um, had a little half an hour break, had a massage, because I needed one. And then... Just carried on. And you're allowed those breaks, because obviously, yeah. what I mean, there's loo breaks, I'm guessing. Yeah. Was the food breaks? Do you need to keep your energy and your stamina up? Yeah, I actually struggled to eat quite a lot. So I had someone that was doing my food for me, who was a member, and she basically told me exactly what to eat. But it got to the point where I was like, no. So I just had to drink carbohydrates to keep myself energised, basically. And did friends or colleagues come along to keep you going, to keep you motivated? It's a long time, isn't it? Yeah, I'm not going to lie. I had people there the entire time. So from 6am on the Friday till 6am on the Saturday, five people actually stayed the entire time and slept there. And then we probably had about... <laughs> they slept there? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they did sleep. You didn't, they yeah, did. Yeah, and then I think we probably had about 100, 200 people coming in throughout the day. Um, just keeping me going and Whooping burping when and I was cheering. burping. Yeah, and they were burping too. And I don't think <laughs> I could have done it without everybody else. To be fair, it sounds. I mean, it, it, the record, the previous record was five thousand five hundred and fifty-five. Yes. And, and what did, what was the final number you actually got to? Uh, Six thousand two hundred and forty-seven. So yeah. that's quite a that's quite a big difference. How long does it take you to train for for for, for 20, twenty-four hours like that? How, how um, much training did you do to get to that point? I probably did about three to four months of proper training. Um, like I'm training all the proper, I'm training all the time proper, anyway. Proper well, like burpee specific. Like normally I'll just go in and <laughs> so how many do hours? Weights. How many hours? You know, how how much do you do in the gym? How many hours a day? Or this is going to put me to shame. Uh, so like how, how... one to two, maybe two hours. <laughs> and then I did some sessions that were like six hours long. That's the most I ever did before I did it, because I thought it was merely mental. After that point, I was not, I'm not going to be able to train for 20 hours and think it. Because if I've trained for 20 hours. I thought I might hit the record before I've even done the event, so I didn't want to do it. <laughs> but, but equally, the strain it's taken on your body. When, you, yeah. when could you next attempt a record? I think it'd be quite a while. Yeah, like I didn't think I'd be. I get sore from training, but this was this was like nothing I've ever felt. My mum had to dress me for three days. It was like being a child again. And tell I us couldn't about move. The, tell us about the charity you raised the the money for. Yeah, so uh, it's called Rock to Recovery. Um, they. They're quite close to the gym anyway as an organisation. Um, we've done an event for them before, um, which was 24 workouts in 24 hours, and we raised money for them then. Uh, and this is, just seems like it's a really important charity uh, organisation. It helps veterans and those in the kind of blue light services. They're either still in, have left, their families. It gives them the support for kind of stress-related illnesses or um, feelings that they're having. And I just think right now that's really important. And sometimes getting that help can take quite a long time, mm -hmm. whereas Rock Recovery go straight to the people, they get them the support. There's no limit on the number of sessions that they can have. If one person's stressed in a family, the whole family's affected. So they ultimately help the whole family and just give them as much support as they need. They never say, that's enough sessions. They'll just say, keep going, we're always here. And I just think that's really important. And for a smaller organisation, it's good to kind of give those people the support. Oh. Lauren, fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming no, on. No worries. Congratulations Thank on you your much. world record Thank and you. for raising funds. And is your sort of just giving page still up and... Yeah, yeah so it's a, cool, it's a Team Fortitude page. Um, so we've got that. So if you just type in Burpee World Record, Team Fortitude, Rock to Recovery, it'll come up. And, yeah, please feel free to donate. We're 
about £8,000 at the moment, so... Brilliant. Really good, yeah. Well done. Excellent. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Now, have you ever wondered what you'd do if you ruled the world? What laws would you change? What would you do differently? Well, every week we like to ask a famous figure exactly that. And this week it's the turn of her stylist to the stars, Nikki Clark. So, Nikki, welcome to the show. So imagine Hi. if you rule the world, what's the first thing you would do? Uh, I, mean, I mean, I had so many of these things, but they all sound very kind of like sort of nothing in yet. I mean, I had things like, you know, like, oh, should my... Um, should all high streets become pedestrianised? I mean, I'm in St John's Wood and they pedestrianised it. I thought, my God, this is great, you know. I mean, I'm trying to think of the downside of, you know, maybe access, people with disabilities maybe. But then I'm thinking, you know, if all of the roads near there, why aren't every single uh, uh, high street, you know, you're literally just pedestrianised? You know, we get rid of cars. And then I sort of thought, about things like, well, I should be, should be making everybody have their hair done every week. You know, <laughs> yeah, well, I... <laughs> looks great, you know? I thought that's why you'd have a pedestrianised zone. Your hair would be a nightmare every day if everywhere was pedestrianised and you were exactly. walking everywhere in the world. So there was, there was, exactly. he was thinking about that. Yeah. 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 So everybody should get their hair done. Look fabulous all the time. Is that what yeah, it is? I think, you know, and I think it's quite serious. I mean, the point is, how wonderful will everybody look all the time? You, know, you get, it's compulsory. You've got to go and have your hair a blow dry or you know something. <laughs> <laughs> a bit like you, Esther. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. See the way you said a bit like you, Esther, and not you, Philip. No, no, no. If, the, if there was a law for looking fabulous, <laughs> I'd be breaking it every day of the week. I can tell you. <laughs> Uh, you. <laughs> now you've never, but you've never fancied uh, ever going into a sort of politics or, or anything like that. No, always hairdressing was always for you. Do you know what? It's so funny. I mean, I'm kind of blessed in this job, and you wouldn't really believe it, but I actually have a huge interest in politics, and I have sat in um, Parliament before, the way <laughs> certainly the way you have, and I've actually done a number of things. But there was a point. I think I did. I think I did the political show on the BBC once, and um, and I think my uh, business partner said, "You know what? It might be better if you just drop the politics stuff." I mean, it was actually when Scotland were, um, uh, you know, talking about the you know the first referendums, and I actually was in support of them staying within the union, and I didn't say anything other than you know pretty much that actually. Oh my God! I mean, thank God I'm not on social media that much because the vitriol that comes with it just is, you know, not something that you would, you know, you're always going to upset somebody. I mean, it, it probably didn't help when I said something like it's all getting a bit brave heart. So that kind of was the, you know, the, the, the thing that sort of got them going a bit. But anyway, it's like, so, so yes, I do have a huge interest in it, but I probably tend to try and stay as neutral as possible. And I think, you know, in these mad times, oh my God, I mean, I think anybody that sticks their head above the parapet is going to get kind of, you know, shot down but it is interesting actually because i did do margaret thatcher's hair in the 80s i was summoned to do you know uh for uh, a portrait for vogue and it's actually the one that's hanging up in the um in the national gallery now and um i remember before going i come from a fairly um kind of labor orientated uh family then i mean my brother and i are probably not that now but um i remember my sister being kind of you know very uh, sort of, oh, God, you know, stick the scissors in her and all of that kind of stuff. And and actually, it was very interesting because my sister is a very um, um, a sort of famous writer. And, and she was asked to um, uh, make a comment on the on the Thatcher trilogy books recently. And so she actually read all of them in order to get a kind of perspective. And you could see the dilemma that she was in, because here was somebody who she has never, ever supported, but yet could see the problems that a woman faced, you know, certainly being um, surrounded by kind of Etonians all the time. So I think she was starting to have a, a little bit more compassion for her than she might have had before. But, but you know, generally my, you know, my politics sort of tend to be, you know, pretty centre. Um, you know, yes, I, you know, Tory voter, but of course I actually have certain times when I think, no, I think the, the sort of the, the, the more liberal socialist side of capitalism in some way is really what probably is, is the best way forward, somewhere in the middle. I don't really want to be too far left or right, I think. So, Nikki, when you were cutting Margaret Thatcher's hair, <laughs> did you, um, 
Were you brave enough to tell her what you thought she should do uh, when she was ruling the country? Did you give her your "if I rule the world" ideas while you were? You know, the what? Do you know what? <clears throat> it would have been very tempting, but you know, she was surrounded by three um, secretaries, and I think you know whatever one thinks of her, you can't say she wasn't hardworking. I think at the time it was it the problem. It was in the uh, the mid to late eighties, and I think the problems were with. Um, the football hooligans and stuff like that. And of course, I was with David Bailey, who was taking the pictures, who um, was was determined to see how many times he could call her toots. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I mean, it was a fun day. I mean, I, got, I think I got all of about 12 minutes, of which I think six of them were spent trying to get the back combing out. But, um, but no, I mean, it was yeah, just to be able to be in, in Downing Street for the first time then. I actually did go later on when John Major was there as well. But um, but no, it was I think it was an iconic time for me to be there, whatever one thinks of her of her politics. Now you say she's hard working, but to be fair, Nikki, you're hard working. Started work at 14, you know, keep going. You're also eternally youthful, just got <laughs> married uh, <laughs> recently again as well. So I don't know, what is the secret to all of this? I don't know, striving, keep going forward. You've got a new range of products coming out. I mean, what what is your secret? Yeah, I mean, I just listen, I think it's, you know, it must be a kind of the work ethic that comes from uh, being brought up in a in a council house in South London. Uh, Fourteen was a little bit earlier. Actually, it was seventeen, but uh, um, but I, I get the, the the drift. I mean, I think it's just that thing that I I like to work, and you know, I think it really it it says something. I mean, I'm actually in the middle of Giles Brandreth's book, and. Uh, which I think is fantastic at the moment. And he's, he has all these wonderful quotes about, you know, working hard and, it, you know, making happy people and stuff like that. And I do kind of agree that it is what one does. And as far as the kids are concerned, I mean, I mean I've mean, i got grown up, um, you know, kids in their, in their 30s, with grand, you know, I've got grandchildren. But, of course, having a, a four-year-old and a two-year-old certainly keeps you, keeps you lively, <laughs> keeps you poor, actually, as well. But, you know, <laughs> but yeah, keeps you lively. <laughs> Nikki, I mean, you say you started off there on in, in, on a council estate, and I'm looking at some of the people whose hair you've done, whether it's Princess Diana, Isabella Rossellini, Sarah Ferguson, Elizabeth Hurley, Jemima Khan. Then you've got your David Bowies, you've got your George Michaels. Well, one, I want to know yeah. who was uh, your favourite out of all of them, but how did you manage to move amongst those circles? You've got royalty, you've got showbiz superstars. How did you do it? Yeah. A lot, a lot of luck. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, don't, I, th I, I think, you know, maybe being in the right place, you know, helps. I was, and I, I, I probably was that hungry to the point where I just would do anything. I mean, I turned up at 17 and I worked, a, a, lucky enough to be in a very, very uh, major salon called Leonard. And, um, you know, I started picking up pins, uh, sweeping the floor, polishing the brass. I was a great brass polisher, I have to say. And, um, but I... I didn't mind whatever we did. When somebody said, oh, we're doing a shoot and it's going to go on till one in the morning, I go, I'm your man. I mean, I'm there. So, and I think you need to have a bit of a break, but you need to be, you know, there needs to be that vitality. Um, and, you know, I, I think I was doing, I think I did Lulu as my first sort of celebrity. And I was about 17 or 18 years old. And, and you know, if you do things well, then, it, you know, people recommend that it went on and on and on. And that's that's why I think it's just, you know, I have a very uh, large list and it's wonderful. And you, you talk about, you know, the favorites. Some of them are just the ones that are real pinch me moments. You know, I think you mentioned people like David Bowie and Brian Ferry and all of those kind of people are people that as a young teenager, I was just completely besotted by their talent. And so, you know, it's more about them rather than maybe the hair you're doing or something. So, you know, I'm drawn to interesting people. And I suppose in some ways, you know, a lot of those people that are kind of well-known are interesting people. But, you know, a lot of my time is spent doing what one would, you know, uh, call ordinary people. And I kind of get such huge joy out of that. You know, I, I never closed my books. So, you know, I do new clients all the time. And it's wonderful to be able to see that kind of look on their faces, you know, that you're transforming and you're doing something that is, you know, that I always thought was slightly lightweight, but now I kind of don't beat myself up over it so much. You know, I think it's part of the, the thing that people should do. You know, it's like it, it, we're part of the thing that makes people feel better, whether it's, you know, going to the gym or, you know, I don't know, 
doing. Well, and we need, we for me, need for me it's, the last few years. It, it's hair every day of the week. I'm with you 200%. Nikki Clark, yes. it's been wonderful <laughs> speaking to you. Thank you very much. So looking ahead then to this evening's weather and the UK looking generally drier and brighter with winds easing as Storm Malik thankfully passes. Let's look at the detail. Rain and cloud clearing throughout the southwest and southeast of England to leave a dry and fine evening. Temperatures dropping tonight though, leading to a frost for many. A fine evening across the southeast of England. Skies clearing this evening to make way for a chilly night and allowing frost again to form in some places. Moving across to Wales now, and there will be the odd light shower there this evening. Those skies will clear, allowing temperatures to drop as well. And zooming in to the Midlands. Well, there will be some light showers around to the end of the day, but dry for most people there. Let's take you then across to the Pennines now and that rather blustery day that it's been so far easing off into this evening and the skies also across the Pennines clearing eventually, making way for a cold night again and a frost forming for many. Scattered showers affecting Scotland this evening, some turning wintry over high ground. A calmer night though, lighter winds. And then moving over to Northern Ireland. Some isolated showers across the area today. Tonight, winds easing and some clear spells allowing temperatures to drop and frost once again. And that's how the weather's shaping up overnight and into tomorrow morning. Hello there, I'm Eamon. And I'm Isabel. And you're watching the GB News digital stream across the United Kingdom. And around the world. If you're here in the UK, you can also watch us on your TV screen. GB News is Freeview Channel 236. On Sky, we're Channel 515. 626 on Virgin Media. Just remember, you might need to retune your TV to watch the channel. Yeah, and if you are doing that, find out more about retuning by going to gbnews.uk. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilized conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News.